dearly. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. This time, Brother Rick Major will have our sermon. I'll get your PowerPoint. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hello, church. How are you? It's a blessing to be here. And I want to thank each of you for coming out and those who have tuned in um, via, the, via the Internet and live streaming. Technology is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Because we, even during a pandemic situation like this, we're still able to, to meet and greet one another, even if it is in a virtual uh, environment. And Sister Carol Lee, I've been, uh, I've been bragging about your music for, for, for many, many years. And I always tell people, see, I'm old school, so I, I believe when we get to heaven, there will be different types of music, and I, I would imagine. But I think that first group of songs is going to be so high and holy and majestic and your music always takes me to that place of, of what I think heaven will be like so so thank you so much for that and thank you brother Jeff and uh, for elder Jeff for uh, inviting me and I wanted to just start out by saying I I, I don't know if the, the brother elder Jeff the, the people who were teaching the Sabbath school class the brother and the sister that were teaching it's, it's interesting, every time, every time I come to this church, I'll sit and I'll kind of listen to the Sabbath school lesson, and whatever I'm preaching about, they're talking about that in the Sabbath school lesson. <laughs> it's amazing how that happens. I mean, and I've told you that before, Elder Jeff, every time. I mean, even some of the same text, and so I was like, oh, it's, it's definitely a divine appointment that the Lord allowed me to come here today. The topic that we have today is special to me to the point that I, I drove here from Garner, but I, brother, I could have I skipped, I could have run here or dri ridden a bicycle and gotten here in about the same amount of time. I was really excited, and thank you so much for the opportunity to come here today. I, when I think about what's happening in the world, and I was listening to the Sabbath school lesson this morning, and I was just sitting there thinking, this isn't necessarily the sermon, but it's an intro because the Lord just gave me that inspiration from your Sabbath school lesson here in Pittsburgh. But I was just, uh, Psalm 91, seven, it says, a thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. And when you look up the word nigh in Strong's, it, it makes a very strong connection. It's, it, it relates that to uh, uh, intercourse. It relates that to a special connection, a special bond. And so that means that if something can't come nigh thee, according to the Bible, that means that no matter what's going on in the world, the, the fires that are out in California that are burning at the rate of, I think they said is the, the, a football field per second or something like that, just amazing. Not only that, but the social unrest and all the things that are happening. And, I, and, and, and speaking of what's going on in the world, we're sitting here in a COVID environment where we all have on our masks and things like that, and social distancing, and I see the X marks on the, on the pews and everything. So we're doing, uh, per uh, Romans uh, 13, what Caesar has asked us to do because it doesn't violate what God has asked us to do. But when something that we're asked to do violates what God tells us to do in his holy word, then that's when we draw the line. But in this case, I came, I brought, I brought my mask, and I social distance. I gave Elder Jeff the fist bump and all of that. That's no problem. But I know that it said, the Bible says that if it means that much to, to God, which it does, it, none of that will come nigh me. In Mark 16, 18, Jesus went so far as he says, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So not only are we not going to get sick if we have the power of the Holy Spirit and God in us, it says, but we'll lay hands on those who are sick. And it says that they shall recover, brothers and sisters. 
So we think about the power that God has given us. Think about all the things that he has done for us uh, in his whole, through his holy word. Now, you're here for a special event today. The Bible tells us what God's people do every time that we come together. It says in the book of uh, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm going to read verses 22 through 24. It says, but ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God and unto the, the, the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels. That means that even though this, this uh, sanctuary is not filled up, even though sanctuaries across the country are not filled up, even if everyone in the United States and around the world went to church at the same time on God's holy Sabbath, that wouldn't even be a fraction of the beings in this universe who are meeting with him, with us right now and joining us in holy worship. It says, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Just men, and that means mankind, men and women, made perfect. I'm made perfect through Jesus Christ. I have his righteousness. And brothers and sisters, when you think about that, it says, and to Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new covenant. Just open the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 2, 4, 7, 9, all of those, 11, all those, Jesus Christ is our mediator. He is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. This is the antitypical day of judgment. That means that this is the day of judgment, brothers and sisters. And it says, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And so finally, I look at it and I say, okay, the, the, the Sabbath school lesson today, it said, they, they read the text, and the text is 1 John 5, 12. It says, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Brothers and sisters, do you realize, For I'm, I'm 61 years old going on 62. I might look like I'm 90 years old, but I'm, I'm in my 60s. Think about this. When I was younger, I said, well, if, if, if I could just get Christ's righteousness, then I'll be, I'll be ready. I, I could just... But I never knew when I had Christ's righteousness because something would always happen. I say, OK, I thought I was righteous. But then and then I said, oh, I know what it is. If I just get more faith, because if I have the faith of Abraham and, and Moses and all of them, then I'll be able to overcome with faith. And then I realized, well, it, it, it wasn't the faith. And I said, well, if I get salvation, if I get salvation, if I get repentance, if I brothers and sisters, 1 John 5, 12 says, he that hath the Son hath life. So if I get Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, Jesus is the objective. If I have Jesus, I have faith, I have righteousness, I have salvation, I have forgiveness, I have all of those things, brothers and sisters. If I have Jesus Christ, that means that, like it said in Psalm, Psalm 91, 7, if I'm somewhere and an atomic bomb is falling and it's two inches from my face, even if it explodes, just like the, the, the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace, Jesus Christ will be in there with me and I can overcome and I can survive even under those circumstances. If you have Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, if you get nothing else today and we still have the sermon to go through, Jesus Christ is what we need. Jesus Christ is the way. Jesus Christ is the Son of God and if we have him, we have life. Let's pray, Lord. Lord, bless us as we go through this sermon. Lord, bless us. I'm an imperfect vessel, Lord. So the, the word that you gave me and the word that the Holy Spirit gave me, if it's not delivered the way that you want, then blame me, Lord, because I'm an imperfect vessel. But I pray, Lord, that your message will touch one heart and one heart will be brought to you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Look at that word. Presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S. -E -E that word can be pronounced two ways. And as far as parts of speech, it's a noun sometimes, it's a verb sometimes, and it's an adjective sometimes because it can be, you can present yourself, okay? That's an introduction, okay? That's an action, that's a verb. It's also a present. Okay, and you can see the gifts up there. And so that's a noun. It's a tangible 
visible thing. And then, of course, present is also an adjective. I'm present. I'm here today. So that's an adjective. I'm here in your presence. So we're going to talk about that today, the three presents. Well, I guess I'm giving my secret away. I was in the first grade in 1965. So that was long before 99% of you were even born. <laughs> so, but that was a big year for me. I was, number one, I was angry because I, my birthday is in January, and so many of my friends started school in the year before because they were born, you had to be born before, I think it was October 1st. And I went to a seventh day, small Seventh-day Adventist uh, church school in Toledo, Ohio. But I couldn't, I couldn't start the, the year that many of my friends started because they were born either that summer or they, of, of 1959 or, or, or they were born before the October 1st. And so I, obviously I, I lost out on that. And so, or in 1958. So I had to wait. I felt it was an extra year. I was six years old, but I was going on seven. So I was upset. But when I got to school, you have to remember the, the social climate at that time. And so Dick and Jane had been out since the 1930s, I think. And it was the primer that most uh, children around the country uh, read. And my sister started the year before I did. And so she had the same problem because her birthday was in December. So many of her friends started the year before she did. Long story short, I had read, when my, my sister had the book, and if, you, you, if, if you, many of you have children and grandchildren, the youngest one is always going to try to do what the older one does. And so I got her book, and she was in the first grade, and, and you know, uh, fun with Dick and Jane. And so, you know, see, spot, run, 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 spot, run, you know. Uh, and so I was able to phonetically sound out many of the words that she could sound out. And so by the time she finished the first grade, I was ready for the second grade too because I had studied everything that she studied. So I went to school, and it was interesting because that first day, they handed out a new book in 1965, and it was still Dick and Jane, but Dick and Jane had a new friend. And so you can see on the, so Dick and Jane got new friends. It was Mike and Pam and Penny. And so I had never seen black people or colored people or Negroes or African Americans in a book like that. And then to, to, to really add uh, what I thought was just the, the icing on the cake, uh, their father, he it looked like he wore a suit to work, you know, or at least maybe to church or something like that. And so I was like, wow. That's great. And when you read the book, uh, Dick and Mike, they were great friends and they had conversations. And I was like, wow, now that's the way that the world should be. So I, you know, my thing was I couldn't wait to go to school. Uh, the year before, uh, they always had a day where it called it family day, where the family could come and they could attend the class. And so I went with my mother. And I sat in the corner. I said, I can't wait until next year because I'll be able to. The first thing I'm going to do is I noticed that they took role in the class. And the teacher said, so my sister's name is Kim. And she said, Kim Major. And she said, present. And then some of the other names were read off. So I was like, I'm going to be the first one, Elder Conkin, next year when they say, you know, R Richard Major, I'm going to raise my hand and say present. So I, I was ready. Well, the interesting thing is I, that was going to be, that was my goal to say that I was present. The interesting thing is my teacher, and her, I'll say her name, her name was Fern Losey, and she taught, now that's not her picture, but it just reminds me of her. Uh, I thought she was like 97 years old, and it turns out she was in her 40s, and so, <laughs> but I thought anybody over 20, your life was over. But anyway, Miss Losey, I, I, she, said, she said, okay, we're getting ready to, to do some introductions and start the class. And so I was like, oh, 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 oh. And she was like, calm down, calm down. I was like, oh, 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 oh. I said, I, I want to say I'm present first. I want to be the first person whose name you read off. And she said, no, we're not, we're not doing that. She said, I want you to present yourself. And I was like, present myself? What is that? And she said, I want you to give us your name. Give us your, uh, what are your aspirations in life? What do you want to be? It was like, in, in first grade, I don't know. <laughs> I want to just make it to school, back to school tomorrow. 
So she wants you to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your family, tell, a little, tell us a little bit about your summer. What did you do this summer? And so I got up and I introduced myself, and I wanted to say present, and she said, present yourself. So that was something that I always hung on to. Well, the Bible tells us to present ourselves. This is the first phase of coming to Christ. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your, your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, reasonable service, Be, being reasonable, that when you come to Christ, when you present your body a living sacrifice unto God, that's just, the Bible says, you haven't done anything special. Actually, you've done something that helps you out. And so your reasonable service, and when you think about it, presenting your body a living sacrifice. And I have a picture there of Harriet Tubman, and we're going to talk about her a little bit later when we talk about presenting yourself a living sacrifice. Isn't it something on the left side of the, of the picture, it says a dead sacrifice. For so many years, for so many years, the children of Israel had offered uh, goats and bullocks and, and calves and, and all types of animals. And this, isn't it interesting? Even when they met uh, at Mount Car Carmel, and I think there were like 400 some bullocks that were consumed by that fire that came down from heaven. And it not only lapped up, it not only consumed the animals, but it says it consumed the rocks and things like that. I mean, there was nothing left but dust, but dust. But then God says, he says, I'm tired of your sacrifice. He said, he said the, the stench of the animals who are sacrificed, it, he said, it's just, it's just an abomination. He said, I, I can't even bear it. He said, it just comes in my nostrils and I, I don't even want to smell it anymore. What he wanted to see and what Jesus Christ wants to see is a living sacrifice because a living sacrifice, brothers and sisters, is a person who wakes up in the morning and says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? What wilt thou have me to do? That's a living sacrifice. Whatever your mission is for me, Jesus Christ, I'm going to do that today because that's presenting myself a living sacrifice. And every day the mission changes, brothers and sisters, the things that he wants you to do within the context of being a living sacrifice. That changes, but being a living sacrifice is the objective. Philippians 3.8 says, yea, doubtless, and this goes back to the Sabbath school lesson today because I think the sister mentioned this. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of how many things, brothers and sisters? All things. And do count them but dung. Whatever I lost, my car, my house, my job, my friends, everything. He said, whatever I lost, Paul said, and do count them but dung. That means it's worthless. It's something that I don't even want to touch. It's contaminated. It stinks. He says that I may win Christ. Do you know what winning Christ is? Winning Christ means that you now have Christ in your life. I have won Christ. That means I didn't, it didn't take much convincing because Jesus Christ said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. So I don't have to win him in the sense of win him over that I can become a child of the living God. You read Ephesians 1. It was, it's my destiny to be adopted into the family of God. So I, winning that I may win Christ, that means that my life becomes a perfect example of Jesus Christ. And I know, we, you know somebody's going to write their congressman or their senator and say, this fool came down to Pittsburgh and start preaching perfection what I'm saying is, if you love someone so much, and I love, I love Elder Jeff. He's done a lot for me in my life, and he's been a dear friend. What do you think it would take for someone to come to me and say, I want you to take this sledgehammer and hit his foot with it and hurt him? It would, it would t you couldn't pay me to do that, okay? So to win Christ, brothers and sisters, is to say there is nothing that I would do knowingly to wound my Savior, Jesus Christ. There's nothing that I would do. I see Sister Joy. What, what do you think it would take for, for Elder Jeff to knowingly wound his wife? It, it, you couldn't pay him to do it. 
or to wound young Ethan, his son, his only son. You couldn't pay him to do it, brothers and sisters. So Paul said, I count it as dung. Whatever I had to lose on behalf of Christ, whatever I had to give up, whether, whatever I ate, whatever I drank, all those things, maliciousness, anger, recrimination, retribution, all those things, I gave them up that I may win Christ. We also see in verse 9, it says, and, being found in, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Remember, he didn't say faith in Christ. He said the faith of Christ. There's a huge difference there. That means that that song, I can be like Jesus, the faith of Christ, which is of God by faith. He said, it says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering that I may know him. Knowing is an experience. It's, it's almost a, it's, it's higher than a physical experience. But when we talk about marriage and knowing one another and loving one another, it's even higher than that. It says, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. It didn't say comfortable. It said conform. I'm conformed to the knowledge of his death and the fellowship of his sufferings, brothers and sisters, the faith of Jesus. All right. So when you present yourself, Jesus Christ put it best in, in Luke 9, 23, and this is the NIV. And he says, whoever wants to be that, my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Taking up your cross daily, young man, daily. Take up your cross when you wake up in the morning, taking up that cross daily and following him. So that, that means that when Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus Christ, before he, this wasn't on the cross. This was Luke 9. This was long before Jesus Christ went to the cross. And yet he expected people to be walking around the earth spiritually dragging crosses behind them, allowing their, their carnal man, their carnal nature to be crucified, taking up that cross daily and following Jesus Christ. Because when you do that, you won't take your sledgehammer and hit Brother uh, Jeff on the foot. You won't do anything to offend someone. You will love your fellow man. You'll love uh, people as Jesus Christ loved them. Now, I've talked to a lot of people. You go over people's uh, houses for, for, for dinner and lunch and all that, and you talk to people, and, and generally people will say, well, it's just about love, just love, 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 love. Yeah, it's about love, but read these texts. Genesis 3.15, it says, and I will put enmity, and I put in parenthesis, you look it up in Strong's, it says, I will put enmity, hostility, hatred between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. The first thing that he said about Jesus Christ, the seed that was to come, it says that I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Jesus Christ, it says in Hebrews 1.8, thou hast loved righteousness. Yes, we always emphasize that. Jesus Christ loved righteousness. He was righteous. It says, and hated iniquity. So because of those two things, not just one or the other, because of those two things, it says, therefore, all right, it says, thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, both things. He's, therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So I can't, I can't completely have Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit or God or righteousness or salvation if I claim to profess to love Jesus Christ, but I still love iniquity too. I still want to be over in the world, but I come to church and I say hallelujah, praise God, but it says the reason that God gave him the oil of gladness above his fellows is that he loved righteousness and he hated iniquity just as strongly. The, as strong as God, Jesus Christ loves us 
is how the same strength that he hates sin and hates iniquity. I, I put down some, some uh, I was reading a book called The Sanctuary Service by M.L. Andreas, and he has some very powerful, powerful statements about this same thing of righteousness and iniquity. He says that, humanly speaking, it says hatred of sin is vital to full salvation. It's vital. And if you look on the left, we should, we should see sin, brothers and sisters. You talk about this pandemic. You talk about going to uh, a, 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 a doctor or to the hospital or something like that. We should see sin as it is, brothers and sisters, sin is the thing that killed God, my son, his son, Jesus Christ. Sin is the thing that put him on the cross. My sin, I'm not talking about anybody else in here. My sin put Jesus Christ on the cross because if he did not come and die on the cross, then I could not be saved. I would have been Satan's forever. Satan would have been the ruler of this world forever because he would have had one person, me, and rather than, rather than let me die or live in that condition, Jesus Christ came. It says, humanly speaking, no man is safe until he has learned to what? Hate sin. Remember, we go back to Genesis 3.15. He put enmity. And we also read the other text where it says that Jesus Christ, because he loved righteousness and hated iniquity. This is not breaking new ground here, brothers and sisters. No man is safe until he has learned to hate sin as deeply as he formerly loved it. He may resist sin, he may even flee from it, but as long as there is a lingering love of sin in the heart, he is not safe on safe ground. And like I said, I am chief. When, it talks about, when we talk about people who loved sin, you talk, you, you're looking at them. I enjoyed it. I, I loved sin, the, the pleasures of sin. And yet it says that we have to actually hate sin. In Christ, love of righteousness was accompanied by a hatred of sin, of evil. Because of these two attributes, he was anointed for his work by God. And we just read the text. Finally, this combination of love and hatred must be in each Christian. Were it not for the fact that God implants in the heart of every Christian a hatred of evil, as well as a love for the right, there would be little hope for us, brothers and sisters. And when you, of course, when you read uh, Romans 12, 3, everyone in this room, everyone in this room was born with a measure of faith, a measure of faith. And when you read the Bible, we've talked about this many times. I've come here, I don't know how many times I've said this, a measure of faith. It, it says, if you, if you have the faith, Christ said, if you have the faith of a, of a mustard seed, it says that you could say to that mountain, be thou removed and cast into the midst of the sea. Imagine, imagine uh, Mount Kilimanjaro or Mount Everest or uh, Mount St. Helen just ripping itself out of the earth and being cast into the midst of sea because you exercise the faith of a mustard seed. Well, Romans 12, 3 says we were born with a measure of faith. That's more than the faith of a mustard seed, a measure of faith. And the Bible says if you had a measure of wheat, you could make a little cake and eat it, something for breakfast or, or dinner. God has given us more than enough power to not only survive, but to overcome, brothers and sisters. But view, we must view sin as the most heinous and treacherous and despicable and diabolical uh, virus that we could ever encounter on this planet, brothers and sisters. All right, so we talked about present yourself. That was the, that was the verb. Now we're talking about the noun. All right, so presenting yourself, what do you get for presenting yourself? Of course, a noun, this, this means that it's a gift. It's a present. So what are we getting as far as a gift or a present? Take a look at this, Luke eleven thirteen. It says, if ye, then who is ye? It's us. It's everyone in this room and everyone within the hearing of my voice. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. I have, I have grown, my, uh, Cynthia and I, we have a grandson. Trey is 23 now. So our, our oldest grandchild is a grown man. Okay. And when he was younger and when our youngest son, Richard, was younger, they used to love 
Christmas. They wanted to see what kind of gift. And guess what? I can assure you, and I know that many of you who are present are, are parents and grandchildren, grandparents, it gave me more pleasure to see the smile on the grandchildren's face and on my children's faces than what they, the pleasure that they receive for, re, for receiving the gift. Because when you receive a gift, you're focused on the object. When you give a gift, you're focused on that object, how the person receives it, and the pleasure that you receive for giving them the gift. So you get, you get like a triple uh, gift out of that because you've given something to someone who ha is actually receiving joy from it. How much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So the, 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 the present or the gift that we're looking for, brothers and sisters, is the Holy Spirit. And God says he will give you the Holy Spirit. He wants to give you the Holy Spirit even more than you want to give your children or your grandchildren or your spouse a gift, a good gift. It says, Acts 10, 38 says, how God anointed Jesus Christ. He anointed him, right, of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. So what comes with the Holy Ghost? Power. With the Holy Ghost and with power, it's an anointing who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So what ability do you have when you have the power of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit? It says that now the good that you do is not innate, is not of yourself, but it's the gift of God. Whatever we do, whatever good we do, we can't claim it because it's the gift of God. But the Holy Spirit, when you have the Holy Spirit, you have power, brothers and sisters. And that power is something that we really need right now. A present from God means Ephesians 2, 8. It says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. By grace, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Salvation, remember I talked earlier, salvation, grace, faith, all these things are attributes, but it's still Jesus Christ. It's still his, Jesus Christ through the power of his Holy Spirit. Verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship. Now, at, you know, when we talk about his workmanship, uh, I'm in construction. And when we finish a building, we do what's called a, a substantial completion inspection. And all the lighting systems and the high vac heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems, the structure, everything has to be just right. And it's interesting, it says that we are his workmanship. So what kind of structure do you think God wants me to be? He wants me to be upright, to have the power of the Holy Spirit, to have that free gift, to be ex totally acceptable unto him. It says, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Uh-oh, there's a problem. And my father used to work in the 1970s back in the, uh, he was in the space industry in the early 1970s. And so we used to talk about mission control and things like that. And when I read that, I say, uh-oh, mission control, there's a problem. Why? Because it says, God, be before I was even born, before I was even born, not after I was born and God looked at me and said he might be a, a nice addition to my family. It says, before I was born, God had already ordained me to walk in his righteousness. That's, that's amazing, brothers and sisters. And of course, how do I get that? Romans 2, 4 says, that the goodness of God leads to repentance. Here's a homework assignment. When you go home to, uh, today, take out your phone or, or, or uh, you know, however you, you do it, especially electronically, Bible Gateway or Blue Letter Bible or whatever, and pull up and then just type in the word repentance. Just, just type that word in and see how many times we talk about Revelation 20, I'm sorry, uh, Matthew 24 and 28, this gospel of the kingdom, shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And then we talk about going out and to preach and teach and baptize and bringing people, souls to Christ. But it's interesting, look up repentance and see how many times Jesus Christ himself talked about, Jesus, I, I, you, you, you'll rarely see anything that says Jesus Christ said, uh, I came to preach the gospel. <laughs> Jesus was the gospel. He said, my words are spirit and they are life, John 6, 63. He, was, he is the gospel. 
So he said, I came to bring Israel to repentance and give them forgiveness. That's what Christ, Christ wanted to bring Israel, his people, back. That, 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 that holy convocation that we read about in uh, Hebrews 12. The spirits of just men made perfect. Those just men made perfect. They were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. But at some point, they received Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. You, if you're looking to, to repent for whatever it is that you've done in your life, whatever wrong you've done, you'll, ne you'll, you'll still be trying to do it, and you'll see the, the Son of, of God coming in the clouds of, of, of heaven. You'll never be able to repent on your own. It's the goodness of God, the things that he does, the little things, the big things. I saw a lady on, 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 on TV. The lady was pushing her buggy across the street. And you all saw it. The lady was pushing her buggy across the street, and a huge, huge SUV was barreling down on her. And I said, why would they put this on television? Because she was going to get smashed like a steamroller or something. A second later, just as that SUV was about to hit this woman, and she's walking, and her child's walking to, at her side, and she's got a baby in the stroller, and she, even, she never saw what was going to hit her. And just at that moment, a small car, and I'm talking about a small, it looked like a, a, a Ford Focus or something, really small car, hit that SUV and knocked that SUV out of the way, and it didn't even hit hit the woman. She didn't even have to duck or move. It just knocked that car right out of the way. And I was like, that's the goodness of God. And whenever that lady thinks about that, and whenever her children think about it, whenever I think about it, I say it's the goodness of God. And if that lady is thinking about the goodness of God, it will, that's what will lead her to repentance, not her own works, brothers and sisters, not her own works. Philippians 2, 5 says, therefore, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Imagine if I had the mind of Christ in me. I would know, I wouldn't, you know, the, the little, I've said this before, the little WWJD, what would Jesus do? You know, the little band, okay, um, I'm about to fall off this cliff here. What would Jesus do? Let me see, what would he do? No, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in, in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. The king of the universe took on the form of a servant. He washed my feet. He, wa he cleansed me of my sins. He made me whole, and yet the contamination that was in me, he took upon himself. He bore my sins. He took upon my iniquity. It says, and made himself in, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in the fashion of man. Now, why did he say it twice? Okay, we got it, was made in the likeness of men. But then it says, and being found in the fashion of men, taking part of the same. It says, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. When you have the mind of Christ, you're, you'll lift up your cross, take up that cross daily and allow your carnal man, carnal woman, to carnal child, to be crucified because you know that it pleases. Jesus Christ said, I, do, I, I, I live to do the things that my father's, my father's will. That's what makes me, brings me the most joy. And then we go to uh, Desire of Ages. Sister White tells us, the Holy Spirit comes to the soul as a what? A comforter by the transforming agency of his grace, and remember, the Bible says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So the grace that Noah needed, we always talk about grace as something, receiving something that you didn't deserve, mercy, not receiving what you did deserve. But isn't it interesting? There's more to it than that. Grace is also power from Christ, according to Acts 10, 38, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's grace, because I don't deserve the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome. But when I have that grace, it says the image of God is reproduced in the disciple and he becomes a new creature. That's the grace of God. He's created me. And we just saw that we are the work of his hands. We are his. The workmanship of Christ is to create us as new creatures, brothers and sisters. I'm excited about that today. And of course, 
it says in uh, Acts of the Apostles. She tells us that since this is, uh, now, now read this with me. Since this is the means by which we are to receive power, she put that first. Why do we not hunger and thirst for the gift of the Spirit? Again, since this is the means by which we are to receive power, we just read Acts 10, 38. Why do we not hunger and thirst for the gift of the Spirit? Why do we not talk of it, pray for it, and preach concerning it? The Lord is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to those who serve him than parents are to give good gifts to their children. We just read that, Luke eleven thirteen. For the daily baptism of the Spirit, every worker should offer his petition or her petition to God. The daily baptism. So let's think about it. I wake up in the morning. It says that I should take up my cross and follow Christ daily, allow him to crucify my carnal man. Isn't it interesting? If I wake up in the morning and I pray daily, for the power of the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit, I'm not trying, I don't have to try to crucify my anger or crucify my hatred or crucify my drinking or smoking or drug. It says that if I pray for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the power that I need to overcome. Amen? All right, so a present from God. We think about it even more. Romans 8 1, it says, There is therefore now. How much condemnation? No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. I woke up this morning. I, the Holy Spirit, through Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, crucified my self. And it says now I'm not condemned. Whatever I did in the past, I'm not condemned, even up to and including the night before or that morning. It says because I walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. In other words, the spirit is not only telling me where to go, he's giving the power, giving me the power to go there. Romans 8, 11 says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus Christ, Jesus from the dead, dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, resurrect, raise to life your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Wow, so now we've gotten to the point where the Holy Spirit is actually dwelling in us. Sister Carolee, it's not just some ethereal being that's way out there and I'll keep praying for him every day. It says that the Holy Spirit, he said it right there, that dwelleth in you. Psalm 51, 12 says, restore unto me, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. The Holy Spirit is a gift. The Holy Spirit is a present. I didn't have to ask. I didn't have to, to pay for it. I didn't have to go down and order it online. It's a free gift. Brothers and sisters, Philippians 1.19 says, For I know that this uh, shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Wow. Salvation is linked to my reception and acceptance of the Holy Spirit. Luke uh, 24, finally we come to Jesus Christ's description of this power. It says, and he said unto them, remember Jesus Christ had been resurrected. He had gone back. He met with the disciples. He was walking with them, talking with them. And then he appeared in their midst. And they're like, oh no, it's a ghost. And <laughs> so he asked them for some food and they gave him a little piece of fish and some honeycomb and he ate it. Would a spirit do that? And then he says, he said unto them, thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ himself to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. All right. He said, go ye, preach, teach, baptize, all those things. But he said, repentance and remission of sins, because when you repent, Remember, confession is, I did it, young man, I, I, I stepped on your foot, I'm sorry. But then I come back, and I stepped on his foot again, and he's like, well, how sorry were you if you keep doing that on purpose? Confessing says, I did it, I'm so sorry. Repentance means, through the power of the Holy Spirit, 
I'm sorry about it. I confessed it. Repentance says, through your power and only your power, dear Lord, now I have actually abandoned that. I've forsaken it. I hate stepping on this young man's foot because I know it hurts him and I love him as a fellow brother. So that's the difference. And that's what Jesus Christ said. He said, I'm coming to help people to repent. And he says, are you, are, you are witnesses. And behold, I send the promise of my father upon you that tarry ye, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. What was the promise that he's talking about? The Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. That's the power that they were looking for. All right. So finally, the third present is an adjective. It means I'm present. I'm here. I'm socially aware. I'm, I'm aware of everything that's happening, the fires, the socially, social unrest, all the things that are going on in the world. And only, the only thing that that helps me to do is let me know what time it is. We as Seventh-day Adventists, we have a message. We, had, we have a prophet in the church, Ellen White, and she told, she, the Bible, she she does not take the place of the Bible, but she certainly has helped me to better understand many of the tenets of the faith that we believe. And so that means that I understand what time it is, brothers and sisters. So being present, the adjective, being present means being about his business. Acts 10.34 says, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted by him. And when you, I told you we were going to talk a little bit about Harriet Tubman. Very quickly, Harriet Tubman was the woman, as you know, who people call Moses. She made, I think, uh, upwards of 19 trips back to the south, the southern plantations. And it was interesting because when she did so, I think she led over close to 300 some souls out of the south back to freedom. Now, it's interesting when we talk about presenting yourself a living sacrifice, and I'm including myself in this question, and it's a rhetorical question. How many people would put their lives on the line to rescue somebody you don't even know? And it's illegal to do so, but you do it anyway because you know what God's word says. It says that God is not a respecter of persons, and yet she did that over and over. And so I, I, I see her as someone who was present. But I also see, brothers and sisters, some, someone who was present in the sense that the church that I belong to, the Seventh-day Adventist church, you will not find a church on planet Earth. And, and I don't, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about anything that's happening right now in the sense that the foundation of this church was based on an understanding that everyone was a child of God and that we should risk life and limb for everyone. And so you had Joseph Bates and Ellen White and John Byington and all these different families. Her son, Edson White, sailed down the Mississippi. His boat was shot at. The people who were helping him were run out of town, tarred and feathered. I, I knew, and I told you this before, I knew a young lady that worked with him. Her name was Anna Knight. She was born in 1874 and died in the 1970s, but I met her when I was a young man. And she would ride through town, people shooting at her while she rode through town on her horse. And she, they said that she was such a skilled rider that she could drop down on the side of her horse and still ride through at full speed so that if the bullets hit, it would hit the, it would hit the horse and not her. And why was she doing that? She was riding through town because she was letting people know, oh, there's salvation. You can receive the Holy Spirit on the midnight star, which is down here on the river. Just, just come out here and join me. But such a perilous trip. So brothers and sisters, when you are present, when you are present, that means you are aware and you're present in the presence of God's Holy Spirit. And that is something that, brothers and sisters, we really need to be aware of. I have a, po a poem that I wrote, and a, one of the verses says, uh, there is a love whose dimensions enlarge exponentially by sharing it with others. This love will never demand exclusion, nurture misinterpretation, or be demonstrated by selective exhibition. The tie that binds this love is not cemented in the superficial placidness of those who by benevolence more reluctant than inspired 
or contrived than sincere, feign peaceful coexistence with others they simply tolerate. This love is exemplified by a life of self-sacrifice and the hand that is lifted to assist the less fortunate. And I challenge everyone in this, this room and those who are listening, if you, if you believe in the writings of Ellen White, download the book called A Southern Work. Wow. That book is, that's a tough pill to swallow. It's a tough pill to swallow, especially as an African American, because Ellen White, she said, look, she said, when you're hated, she said, when, when, when people uh, revile you and say things against you, she said, she said, the thing that, the way that you deal with it is you get closer to the cross. You get closer to Jesus. You don't respond in kind. I don't grab a gun because somebody has one pointed at me. I have to show the love of Christ. And that, that's a tough pill to swallow. If I didn't get up this morning and allow the Holy Spirit to crucify self and allow me to take up my cross and follow Jesus, because whatever I'm going to ever endure in this life, I'll never come close to what Christ had to endure. Never come close to it, because he died for my sins, and my sins are what put him on that cross, brothers and sisters. Christ Christ's presence, it says, so the, the next point, and we're closing here, is to stay in the presence of Christ. If you read uh, your Bible, read particularly, like I said, the book of Hebrews, you know exactly where Jesus Christ is. He's in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. When we stay in Christ's presence, this being the antitypical day of atonement, if I'm in the most holy place with Christ, I have... I, I, I hate sin. I'm repulsed by it. I see it as coronavirus. We're COVID-19 now. I see it as COVID-19 through 47. All of them. I hate them all because I see I've had co-workers at work who come in. They're dejected. They're upset because family members have died. And so we hate that. And that represents sin. Staying in God's presence. It says when Jesus stands up. When his work is finished in the most holy place, read it, uh, Revelation 22, 11, 10, 11. It says, then not another ray of light will be imparted to the sinner. That's a tough, that, that, that's a tough uh, pill to swallow. That's, that's something that I can't even imagine getting to the point where I've, I've tried to, I've, I've, I, I profess to love righteousness, but I still enjoy that sin but all of a sudden, I wake up one day, and Christ has stepped out of the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, and not another ray of light will be imparted to the sinner. But Satan flatters some, and, and I know that you've heard, I've heard sermons like this, and I've had conversations with people, and I can't, you, you have to pray for them. She says, but Satan flatters some through his chosen servants, us, some of us, as he flattered Eve in Eden, thou shalt not surely die. And remember, Eve gave Satan an out when he, he's holding the fruit, and he said, take it. And she said, oh, no, 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 no. She said, uh, I can't. God said that I shall not eat it. And she said, and he also said, don't touch it. And Satan said, I got you, because he didn't say that. He said, don't eat of it. And so... He said, Satan, very quick, he said, oh, <laughs> he said, well, he said, don't eat of it. He said, don't touch it. Hmm. Seems fine to me. I'm still here. And whoa, now he's got her. And so it says, flattered as, as he flattered Eve in Eden, thou shalt not surely die and tells them there will be a season for repentance, a time of probation when the filthy can be made pure. Brothers and sisters, that time of probation is just about over. And the message that we have is a message of love. It's a message, like I said, uh, Matthew 24, Matthew 28, taking the gospel to the world and everything. Let me tell you what the message is. It's a, it's a warning. It's a warning, brothers and sisters, letting people know. Do you, I saw a lady on, on television yesterday out in California or Oregon or somewhere, and she had her two boys, and she's standing there. And she was like, they told us 
to go, but where were we going to go? The fire was right across the street, and then the, the, the wind changed, and it blew it over, and she was standing on the foundation of what used to be her home. Okay, It had burned down completely, completely, and the husband was just trying to pick up. He picked up a charred bear, a bed frame, metal bed frame, and some other things. Brothers and sisters, we are called, yes, we're called to warn people, to, to, to bring people to teach and to preach and to reach and all those, those little cute things that we say. We're called to warn this world that it's about to burn up, brothers and sisters. It is. It is. And we, we think that by telling people what's going to happen, we're frightening them? Do you think that that woman would have, if someone said, hey, Jesus loves you, and she's got her back to the fire, and they don't tell her, now you realize that fire is going to burn your house up. You need to get out of here. No, she would be much happier if someone had warned her. And that's why the saddest thing, the Bible says, there will be people from sea to shining sea that will be coming up to those who knew, our neighbors. And I saw a neighbor walking down the street this morning, and I was like, wow, I said, I, I got to... Lord, help give me a divine appointment with that brother so I can reach him, so I can talk to him about the pure gospel. See, because we're told that people are going to come up to us and say, as my, my little niece says, she always says, really, Uncle Rick, really? They're going to say, you knew, you knew, you're, you're a Seventh-day Adventist, or you, you, you went to the church, you knew, you had all these books, you had the Bible, you had all of that, you knew, and yet you, you, you let me go to work every day, you waved at me and my family, you could have told me, I could have been saved, you knew, see, and so that's going to be the, the, so sad when people are saying the harvest is plant past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved, because being not saved, that doesn't mean there's a season of probation. It means that you are lost forever. There's no coming back. Nahum says that there won't be any coming back. Their sin will not arise a second time. And yet we have this free gift, the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. Finally, the intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. What he's doing now is just as essential as what he did. Okay? He had to die so that his blood would be available and he could apply it. So she says, by his death he began that work which after his resurrection he ascended to complete in heaven. We must by faith enter within the veil whether the forerunner is for us entered. Hebrews 6.20, there the light from the cross of Calvary is reflected, brothers and sisters. So in closing, you present yourself a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. And by presenting yourself to God, that means that you have decided to take up that cross daily. You receive the present, the free gift, the free gift of the Holy Spirit. And God wants to give it to you worse than you want to give your spouse or your children or your relatives free gifts. And, and you receive uh, the joy of seeing them receive those gifts. And also, always be present. Always stay in the presence of God, in the presence of Jesus Christ, in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. If you receive those three presents, those three gifts... Those variations of the word present, those are things that the Bible says, if we have this, we will never fail. So God bless each of you, brothers and sisters, for coming out today, for listening, for understanding that with those three gifts, we truly have the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. God bless you.